Depending on where you are in the United States right now, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. My name is Teresa Lemus. I'm a program associate with Children and Family Futures. Today we will present some information to you about a very important topic on medication-assisted treatment. Specifically, we're going to talk about medication-assisted treatment in the context of your family drug court. We know that many family drug courts are struggling with this issue. Some are excluding clients who are taking prescribed medications in order to address a co-occurring mental health diagnosis or a chronic or acute pain condition. We also know that many of you um, that are struggling with this issue would like some help in developing policies and practices to help you in your guidance to start taking this population and to be more effective with them. So today our goal is to help your FDC team think about how you're handling these types of participants who are required or are prescribed some type of medication that they have for some condition such as mental health or chronic pain. We're very pleased to have today, and you'll hear from them at the towards the middle of the presentation, two guests, and we're going to do a panel with them, both of whom will talk a little bit about how their family drug courts approached this population and approached some of the issues that have come up around this population. And those individuals who are, have joined us today are Penny Claude Felter, who is a licensed clinical social worker. She's with the Jackson County Family Drug Court in Missouri. And we also have Honorable Kyle Haskins, who's with the Family Drug Court from the 14th Judicial District in Oklahoma. So we'll get to hear from them towards um, the middle of this presentation today. So in doing introductions, I just spoke briefly about our panel, but I wanted to introduce myself because many of you um, probably saw that we were hoping to have Dr. Young present this webinar today. Unfortunately, Dr. Young had a family emergency, and so we did some last-minute changes um, to make sure that we could still provide this webinar today. So I will be filling in for Nancy Young. Um, again, my name is Teresa Lemus, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. My background is in nursing. I have a bachelor's degree in nursing and served most of my nursing career in the mental health field and substance abuse. I've spent several years working specifically with mental health, and then I spent the latter part of the last 20 years working specifically with drug and alcohol clients and with family drug courts. I've served as a detox nurse in a hospital-based treatment program, and I had the pleasure of being the executive director of a large treatment program, which is going to help me in presenting some of the information to you today because I have a lot of stories um, around this issue. The treatment program that I operated went from being a pretty strict program where no medication was um, allowed and, and it was really looked down on. And we, we were able to move that treatment program to a program that accepted participants who were on um, medication. And so even before we were talking about this issue, um, I, I had the benefit of having some experience, which I'll try to share some of that with you today. So I love the title of this webinar. So the title of the webinar is Opening the Door to Medication-Assisted Treatment. And I, I'm assuming um, I know who came up with this title. We have a very creative person on staff, but it, I thought it was wonderful because it's our intention that you leave this webinar today with new information, um, not only to open the door, but in some cases unlock the door for this population coming into your FDC. We think collectively that this education provided today, along with other things that you have no doubt participated in, is going to go a long way in helping you open the door to this population. But again, it's going to take education, it's going to take a lot of communication amongst your team and with other members in the community, particularly the medical field, and it's going to take a lot of collaboration. So we wanted to take... Um, just a minute to do a polling question to kind of get a baseline on where you are with your family drug court. What is your current policy or practice regarding medication-assisted treatment in your FDC? 
you have five choices. All right, so what we see here is on this question, what is your current policy or practice regarding medication-assisted treatment? We don't have a form of policy in place. Um, there are some of you who said that. We don't allow medication-assisted treatment um, in our family drug court. Um, it looks like the, the majority of you said we do have a policy that allows for medication-assisted treatment, and so that's great. We are considering it. That's about 18%. That's wonderful. And then we have some that are uncertain. So, so that's great. I think we're going to hit on all of those areas today, and hopefully um, you'll all walk away with information that you didn't have before this webinar. So FDCs are tasked with constantly you know, keeping themselves um, at the forefront of what's going on in their community. And that, that's included when we have to keep up with the trends of what, what's going on, what are, what are our clients using, and how do we address that. In the 1960s, even before we had family drug courts, you looked around and there was a lot of um, use of heroin. In the 1980s, it was cocaine. In the 1990s, I think methamphetamine uh, scared a lot of us, and, um, and we've been dealing with that issue in family drug courts for quite some time. Um, but it's interesting because now, um, since about 2010, we've seen this shift, um, not in all areas, but certainly in, in some, and for some of you it's more, it's more profound than others, that we are seeing um, prescription medications become a real issue, or they are a real issue. And what, what's interesting about this is it's a little bit more complicated for some of us because these medications are seen by many to be legal. They're legal because they're prescribed by a physician. So even though they can be misused or they can be sold, you know, we, we as a society largely still look to the medical community and believe that if something is prescribed, then it's okay. So we're, we sort of, we're dealing with that issue along with the fact that our system, the treatment system, child welfare system, doesn't necessarily have a language that works well or is um, working well for us with the medical community. And so the, that overlay has made this particular drug um, somewhat of a problem for us in family drug courts. Next slide. So what are we looking at? We have 478 million prescriptions each year for controlled substances, and that's information that came from 2010. So we know that it's worse now. Um, 7 million Americans reported non-medical use of prescription drugs. Again, this is coming from 2010. One in four people using drugs for the first time began by using prescription drugs non-medically. And six of the top ten abused substances among high school seniors are prescription drugs. So we know there is a problem. We see this in our drug courts now. We see this in our treatment programs now. And we know that this problem um, is much worse today than in 2010. So next slide. We can just look at the trends for emergency room visits. And this um, information goes from 2004 to 2011. We see a substantial increase in the number of emergency room visits that involved opioid pain relievers. Um, it was a 183% increase over that time period. Um, also, interestingly, George Washington University um, recently published a study in March 2014 where they found a dramatic increase not only in the prescriptions coming out of emergency rooms for opioid such as Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycodone, and Dilaudid, but they found during that same period of time that emergency room um, diagnosis for pain-related complaints didn't change at the even close to the same rate as the number of medications being prescribed for pain. So that's, that was a very interesting um, uh, study to look at when you uh, overlay it with this one. So next slide. If we look at the data for women who are entering treatment for opiates specifically, you're going to see, again, a huge increase from 1998 all the way to 2011. Um, we know that, that 
females entering treatment programs, not all, but are, are, are in general, um, for the most part, in childbearing, their childbearing years. So from um, anywhere from, eight, if you're talking about adults, 18 to in their 40s. So we, we're seeing that their dependence on opiates is increasing um, at an alarming rate. This has implications for all of us, and it's not that we're not concerned about uh, males who are, are um, dependent on opiates, but I think it, it, it sort of brings us to a, a set of issues with women because now we um, have child welfare involvement. We have um, issues related to um, is, is this woman pregnant when she comes into treatment? Um, how do treatment programs deal with that? How do family drug courts deal with that? And I think um, one of the things that we want to keep in mind as we go through today's webinar, that it's critical for family drug court teams to understand the implications for females who are dependent on opiates, um, that they understand the implications for, um, for withdrawal of the opiate while the female is pregnant, and that they also understand that when females are coming into the family drug court, that there's implications for the, the infant um, around um, exposure. So, so we'll talk a little bit more about this, but, um, and we'll, we'll provide some resources at the end of this webinar today, but it is important for your family drug court team to be thinking about how, how do you address the issues surrounding female admissions to your family drug court, and do you have policies and do you have partnerships with the right folks in, the, in your community to uh, address some of these issues specifically with females. So let's back up for a minute and just make sure we're all on the same page and using the same definition. Um, what is medication-assisted treatment? It's the use of medications in combination with counseling and other behavioral therapies. Um, that really the goal is to help provide a holistic or a whole patient approach for the treatment of substance use disorders. Um, it has to be individualized when we're talking about MAT. And research shows that when treating substance use disorders, a combination of medication and behavioral therapies is most often successful. And why is that? I, I want to just sort of go to this third bullet and say why is that that it's most successful? Well, if, we're, if, if we want to engage individuals to um, come into the family drug court, and I know we want to retain them once they're in the family drug court, um, we do have to look at each individual. We have to look at not just their substance use disorder, but what else is going on with, with this individual that may require um, them to be on some type of medication, whether it's mental health or it's some other issue around pain, chronic pain, that needs to be looked at. Um, we need to look at those things because we want to keep these people in the program. Um, we want them to get healthier and we want them to succeed. And so um, this is kind of where the title of the webinar, Opening the Door, this is where we open the door to help these individuals um, meet their best potential. So, um, so I just want to have you keep that in mind as we keep going through this and talk about um, some of the ways that your family drug court can approach this. Next slide. We're just going to touch on three of the FDA approved medications that you would most often see for opioid addiction. The first one is methadone, and you know this one is probably demonized the most um, out of all of the um, medications that we're going to talk about today. And I think I think having um, worked with methadone quite a bit in my past with uh, this population, a lot of the misnomer or a lot of the myths around methadone doesn't necessarily come from the medication itself. It it's it seems to come more from perhaps where the medication is being administered or how the medication is being administered. And many, many times um, it's around the sort of set of controls or set of parameters around the use of methadone with our population. And I'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes. Um, 
buprenorphine um, is a medication that we've seen um, not, it hasn't been around as long as methadone, um, but I do want to point out that, um, that this medication is different in that it's provided in a different setting, usually at a physician's office. And so we have a little bit, I think, in our, in our society, a little bit more comfort around that, the fact that it's being provided through a medical office. Um, the third one we'll talk a little bit about today is naltrexone. And, um, and again, this one is also most often coming out of, out of a physician's office. And so again, I think for our society, we seem to have more comfort with that than we do with methadone. So next slide. So let's just talk a little bit about methadone. I think the most important thing I could say to the participants on this webinar today is um, open the door in your mind if it's closed um, to get some more information and make sure it's accurate information around this medication and where it can be useful for our population. Um, it's important to know that methadone maintenance treatment has been Clinically, it's been confirmed to be clinically effective for opioid dependence, and it's been um, in more than 300 published research studies. So it, it, we know that this medication, when used properly, can be very effective with our population. Um, again, why does it have such a bad rap? Again, that has a lot to do, I think, with where it's provided and the fact that we don't always feel like we have enough control or parameters around the, the dosing, um, you know, what, what type of um, facility it's being um, provided in, who's doing it. So th those are some things that we'll talk about that we as family drug courts, we as practitioners can start making, we can actually make some decisions and, and be more informed about those issues, that, and that alone, I think, will help um, a lot of folks be more comfortable with using, having methadone being used with, their, with this population. So next slide. So again, very important to note that therapeutic doses that, that are determined by physicians um, this is a very effective medication. It's effective because um, it is blocking the receptor sites for the opioid so that when individuals um, who are dependent try to use an opioid, they have a negative reaction. And so it can be overused. It definitely can um, can cause problems for our population if the, ther if the dosage is not appropriate. So what can we do about that? What can we do about how it's prescribed and who's administering it and what type of um, parameters are around this medication? I think, I think it's important to note that for any family drug court that's worked with um, the National Drug Court Institute or with Children and Family Futures, if you, if you adhere to the principles of effective drug courts, one of the things that you know is that you should be aware of who's providing your treatment. Um, we, I know we go out in the field and we talk to every family drug court that we, um, that we work with and we say, have you visited your treatment provider? Do you know if they're using evidence-based practices? Do you know how their clinicians are trained? Um, are you communicating on a regular basis with your treatment provider to ensure that, um, that you have a unified approach to this family? It's no different when you're looking at a methadone maintenance program. Um, it, it might be ground that hasn't been forged in your community and, and perhaps maybe it, it, it will be a new um, opportunity for your family drug court to go out and seek you know, where methadone is being prescribed and, um, and start these conversations, but it is, it is an area that I think um, has really, we have really not gone down when it comes to methadone maintenance. So next slide. 
Buprenorphine has been available, um, like I said earlier, um, just since 2002, and um, it has some advantages over um, methadone. Um, again, a physician is generally the best licensed professional to determine what what the medication um, for this individual is, is best going to fit their needs. Um, buprenorphine is um, a little bit safer in that it can be prescribed at higher dosages and it has less of the potential for um, for having for, for respiratory depression or for someone um, overtaking it and 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 dying from t overtaking the medication. Next slide. Um, so buprenorphine, again, we can use it for detox. So for people going through withdrawal um, who are coming into the system or coming into the family drug court um, system still using. Um, and if it's appropriate for them to go through withdrawal, buprenorphine is certainly a medication that can be used, um, although we, we would um, want to consult a physician. Um, and it's also used for maintenance. And there's different um, types of buprenorphine. You have, um, you have different types of would be brand names. Um, Subutex being one of the brand names is one that is buprenorphine alone, and that one is the one that's used for detox, whereas what we would see more in the family drug court is Suboxone, and that's a medication that you may see an individual who's dependent on opiates take over a period of time for maintenance while they're engaged in treatment and while they are um, working on some of the, the issues around um, relapse prevention so that they can eventually come off of that medication. Next slide. Now, Trexone is a medication, and this is the last one that we'll talk about, that blocks the opiate from binding to the receptor site. So um, if someone is um, taking naltrexone and they then ingest or, or put any kind of opiate into their system, um, that opiate is not going to work. And so it's important to note that for naltrexone, um, Individuals who are prescribed naltrexone are de are already go have already gone through withdrawal, so um, they're not using. It's really a, a medication that is used for um, sort of evening out some of the triggers and some of the um, the urges to use. So it really helps our clients with that compulsive um, wanting to go out and use. Okay, next slide. And I, I, um, I failed to say, well, I think I did say it in the first slide, um, when we're talking about, you know, who's prescribing this medication and where is it being administered, um, we know that buprenorphine and those medications are coming out of a, a physician's office, but um, naltrexone can sometimes be um, administered through a, a clinic. And so, um, again, it's important, regardless of which one we're talking about, even if we're talking about a physician's office, that the family drug court have a relationship with the provider so that there can be some back and forth communication around what are the needs of this individual and how can how can the physician's office be supportive to the family drug court and their goals and vice versa? So that, that ongoing collaboration and communication is very, very important when we're talking about medication-assisted treatment in the family drug court. We just wanted to show the picture, a visual for you, for those of you who may not have seen some of the slides of the brain um, when we talk about um, some of these medications, um, the, if you look at the blue area, and those are receptor sites um, on, this, on this slide, and Vivitrol, which happens to be naltrexone, it's a brand name for naltrexone, um, goes into that receptor site and blocks it. So if you see the, the opioid label, it's green on this picture. 
you see it's coming into the system, it wants to sort of go go directly to that receptor site. That's that's sort of the parking lot that says, um, you know, here's where opioids park. And so the Vivitrol is in the system already. It's it's already parked in that parking lot. So it's already parked in the parking space for the opioid. So the opioid cannot um, affect the brain in the way that it normally would. And so that's how um, these medications have may have a different, um, a, a slightly different way of how they work in the brain. But um, this sort of gives you a picture of, of how they're effective and why they're effective. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, we we put in some slides around, you know, what are some of the myths around the medications that we're talking about today that we commonly um, see with our population, and then we have some myth busters. And I know that when we get to the end of um, of this presentation and we start talking to our panel, they're going to be talking a little bit more about these myth busters, but. But we think that these are useful, and so we wanted you to have these slides um, because they, I think they do um, sort of summarize what we hear uh, across the board from family drug courts who, um, you know, either aren't accepting clients with methadone or or they're just really nervous about um, having any any participant come in who's receiving MAP. We'll just talk briefly about alcohol and um, medications that can be used to help in the therapy and in the recovery for individuals who are dependent on alcohol. Um, I think the thing that I would want to say most about, without going into all of the medications, because these all need to be prescribed uh, by a physician and overseen by a physician, but there's really no no, nothing magic about how these work, um, they, but they certainly are, have been found to reduce the, the cravings and reduce that compulsion that people have for consuming alcohol. So it's not that people won't still use alcohol in some cases when they're taking these medications, but because of the impact that these medications have on the individual, they, they're they're less likely to drink um, once they're trying to get into recovery and they're trying to be abstinent. Um, they may not quit drinking 100%, but they're certainly known to reduce the, in, the alcohol intake. And we know as treatment providers out there that if you can get someone to um, slow down their use, you have windows of opportunity to effect change and to try to engage them in some type of treatment, engage them in the family drug court process. So, um, so when we talk about medications for alcohol, um, probably the biggest issue is why we don't see them used more. So when you have an individual who's dependent on alcohol in your program and you see that they are having a really hard time um, staying abstinent, you may want to seek out the, um, the advice of a physician who is knowledgeable about these medications and who can work with you in your family drug court to help this individual manage those cravings and manage those urges. So it can really make a big difference um, between the person's success um, because it helps prevent relapse and helps them stay in the program long enough to start seeing the positive changes that um, your, the services you provide can have. Um, just a couple other things on medications specifically. Um, as I said earlier, I uh, operated as a detox nurse for uh, quite a few years and then the treatment program that I ran, we had a large detox um, unit. And one of the things that we I think anecdotally um, saw over time, we, we weren't necessarily um, keeping detailed data on it, but we knew over time that people who received medication from our physician and from our, our nursing staff in the program um, to support their withdrawal from, um, from their drug of choice to help, help manage some of the things um, like cravings and manage the anxiety and manage some of the 
the side effects per se of, of their drug use, they stayed. Those are the people who um, tended to stay in treatment and tended to um, start getting more engaged in going to groups, um, doing anything that promoted recovery. So I wanted to just throw in that pitch because um, we sort of are looking at two ends of the spectrum. We've got we've got the medical community, and and I'm a nurse, so I'm part of that. You know, we're we're trained to use medication to help alleviate um, you know things that people don't want to feel, pain being one of them, um, people being uncomfortable. You know, we use medication for for all types of disease processes. If if you know, I'm also a, a substance abuse um, counselor, and so if I look at that side of um, you know where I come from, um, we we on that side tend to not want to use medication. We want people to um, you know to learn how to live without depending on medication, and so we sort of have these two ends of the spectrum that I think um, would we would really benefit in family drug courts if we could start to come to the middle and say, you know, there are a lot of positive uses for medications if they're used um, accurately, if they're used in a way that's being managed, and, and probably most importantly, making sure that everyone is on the same page so that you say, you know, we have a goal for this individual, we have a goal for this family, how can we get there? Um, and, and in particular, for using medication, you need to have that healthcare provider um, involved in those discussions. Next slide. I'm not going to say a whole lot about um, medications for nicotine, except again, we know that um, if you're a, if you're working with a treatment provider that gets federal funds from um, for, for providing services to individuals who can't necessarily pay the full price of um, treatment, we know that they're, they can't smoke. We know that there are issues around that. Um, that impacts engagement and retention and treatment as well. So everything I just said about um, using medication for withdrawal management or for helping individuals um, maintain the recovery, I, I, would, I would throw in the same pitch for nicotine because if an individual needs to be in treatment um, and treatment doesn't allow or can't allow um, nicotine on, you know, on site, they can't allow smoking, then it, it helps us to look at that and say, if we want to keep these people engaged, how can we help them with this issue? Because we know that nicotine is, is is very addictive and a lot of our population suffers from dependence on nicotine. There's really, um, for, for MAT to be effective, there's really, there really has to be a marriage of, um, in this slide it shows you the brain, there has to be a marriage of counseling um, and, and I, would, I would say family drug courts included in that um, because we're the, we're the team working with this family um, to to help them meet the goal of either keeping their children or getting their children back and certainly helping the family to become more healthy. So there has to be a marriage between counseling and if someone needs medication. Again, I can't emphasize it enough. There has to be um, a marriage of those two in order for us to treat this individual because, as you see, counseling impacts a different part of the brain than medication. So medication really targets that part of the brain that we call the reward center that drives that, that, that individual, um, it, it's that compulsion to, to use something that, that that brain is dependent on. So the medication is helping alleviate some of that drive that, that the individual has to use in counseling we're providing the tools, we're providing the information um, and the support to help this family and to help this um, individual not use. And so if you take both of those and you put them together, hopefully you can see that you have a much more, um, you have a much bigger chance of being effective with this participant. 
So if I haven't emphasized it enough, medications can be a very important element for treatment. This bullet says especially when combined with counseling, and I would say um, when we're talking about family drug courts, it's absolutely when combined with counseling and all of the other supports that a, a family drug court team brings um, to an individual who's a participant in their program. And I wanted to point you in the second bullet to, um, to a, um, a resource that um, you might want to look at from the American Society of Addiction Medicine that, that targets and really talks specifically about um, the medications that we've talked about today and the implications for the population of individuals who are dependent on opiates. So it's a really good resource and there's a link down here at the bottom of the slide for, for you to go to if you'd like to pull up that resource. So in summary, um, certainly we use medication-assisted treatment to improve survival. Um, if we use medication-assisted therapy for opioid-dependent people, we know that, um, that we're going we're gonna to see a, an improved outcome for that individual if, if we are also combining that with other um, therapies that we've talked about. We know that it increases retention and treatment. If we're, if we're alleviating that, that part of the brain and we're, we're um, minimizing the the symptomatology that comes with dependence, um, we know that we have a much higher likelihood of impacting them with the other supports that we're providing to them. Um, but also I want to point out that um, medication-assisted treatment is also, um, it's a community health um, prevention activity because we know that opioids, particularly if they're using heroin um, and, and they're using any type of needles, we know that there are diseases that are um, directly related to the use of needles, and that's something that, um, that has an impact for our entire community. And so in a lot of ways, medication-assisted treatment um, is a community health intervention. and. Um, and so you can also think of it that way. All right, so going back to um, we talk about in this webinar, opening the door, why are doors closed? Why, why is the door closed in the first place? And I think that I probably don't have to say too much about this, but stigma is um, it, it's the culprit. Um, we have, there's still a misconception out there, even within folks who serve on your family drug court teams that, um, that dependence and continued use of a substance is a moral weakness. Um, doors are closed for MAT because um, we don't have a language yet, at least uh, a lot of the field doesn't, to really talk to and engage the rest of the healthcare um, providers that we need to be able to engage in order to have a, a really um, strong use of medication-assisted treatment. Um, then I'll just drop down to number four. Um, you know, I, I was trying to think of how to say this in, in you know, the most polite way possible, but, but I, I really couldn't think of one. So I, I think the other reason that the door is closed is because a lot of times you know, we tend to think that punishment for this population is deserved. And so, um, so we just say, you know what, this is, this is the, this is the um, consequence of your actions. And so we really don't, um, we don't look to the medical community. We don't look at the research. We, um, we don't look to that to help inform us. We've just sort of, like I said, shut the door on the whole issue of helping the individual um, reduce their dependence. So next slide. A recent survey found that nearly half of drug courts do not use medications in their programs, and that is a statistic from 2013. Why is that? Um, I alluded to it earlier, primarily um, education. You know, we don't have perhaps the healthcare individuals on our team. We don't necessarily have accurate information about the medications that we could be using or that could be used with our population. 
and we don't have the language and the, the communication with the, with the medical professionals to help us get there. So there's a need for some additional education and, and there's a need to really reach out and start involving other systems in, in this issue um, with our family drug court teams. In 2012, um, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals put out a statement and they said, make reasonable efforts to attain reliable expert consultation on the appropriate use of MAP. So I won't read the rest of it, but they're basically saying the same thing that I've been talking about um, throughout this presentation, which is open the door. Open the door and, and, and start the discussions if you haven't already. And if you have started the discussions, um, maybe this webinar will help you think about, okay, well, what are our next steps um, so that we can ensure that, that medication-assisted um, treatment, is it, we're using it to, the, to the, its full potential and, and, and we're really helping these folks um, get to recovery quicker. The second thing um, that I want to point out is that, and, and I should have referred to it earlier, but um, don't impose blanket, blanket um, statements about um, the use of medications for participants in your drug court. And there's actually um, a paper that was put out by the Legal Action Center. You're going to have, we're going to give you a link to it at the end of the webinar today. But it, it's very interesting to read the paper that the Legal Action Center put out because it talks about um, some of the implications for having blanket prohibitions or, or saying we, we will not allow medications um, in our family drug court or of any type of drug court. So that is a resource you might want to look at. So think about your family drug court collaborative. Think about who sits um, on your committees. Think about who you have in your staffing every week. Um, and think about adding a healthcare professional. Um, think about, it doesn't have to be every week, it doesn't have to be all the time, but when, when you're faced with this issue um, where someone would benefit from medication-assisted treatment, um, that's the point that you want to consult your health care professional. So um, think about who in your community might be able to serve um, on your advisory board or um, you, you know, on your core team that can help you start forging those relationships um, out in the community that you're going to need in order to help this population. So we're going to just talk briefly because, you know, we know that when we're talking about family drug court, we're talking about um, people who are at the intersection of the court, um, substance abuse and mental health treatment and child welfare. And so, um, so we, have, we have a lot of barriers that we um, and myths that we have to get over. The question um, is called a lot, can a parent who is receiving medication-assisted treatment for substance dependence, can they be an effective parent? So can, can a mom who's being maintained on methadone, can she be an effective parent? And I, think, I think we just need to sit with that question and think about what, what do we believe individually but it's certainly a question for your team. It's certainly a question for your team to sit down talk about, um, have a robust conversation about, you know, where are we on this issue and, um, and start educating your team members and start talking about how to move the needle to get to a place where people feel comfortable um, with the concept of medication-assisted treatment. This is one of our MythBuster um, slides. So parents should be off of all drugs, including methadone, in order to be reunified. So I'm not going to go through all the myth buster statements, but again, you could use these um, in some of your team discussions and to help um, get you to a place where you can identify where you're at now and where do you want to go with this topic if you want to start increasing your um, if you want to start increasing your population to include this um, this specific population, then you're going to have to look at these types of things because Many of us don't have the education information around these drugs and medications, so we need to help all of our team members get to a place where they feel comfortable. 
So some of the key questions, um, and, and I know that Penny and Judge Haskins are going to um, touch on some of these um, because they happen in real life, but some of the policy and practice issues specifically around child welfare um, that you can start talking about are here. Does your child welfare system have a policy that addresses the use of medication-assisted therapy for parents? Um, do you have a requirement for minimal dosing? Um, do you have a blanket statement that says people have to be off of medications before they can reunify? Um, start looking at these types of questions in your child welfare system, in your treatment system, and certainly as a, t as a family drug court team. And again, look at where you're at now and start thinking about what do we need to know in order to get more comfortable with um, medication-assisted treatment. We have a polling question. And um, we'd like you to think about what is the strongest or the biggest barrier that your family drug court team has regarding medication-assisted treatment. So if you just think about your family drug court, what's the biggest barrier to implementing or um, having MAT as a, an accepted modality in your FDC? So what is the strongest barrier? Um, stigma, it looks like got about 15%. Lack of quality providers, okay. Um, I, would, I would just point out that, that hopefully, um, hopefully some of the things we talk about today can impact, um, can impact that in your community, particularly if you're bringing them on board and talking to them about um, what you need from them and, and getting on the same page in terms of goals for the family. Um, another group of you said cross-system training and education is a barrier, so meaning you need to have that. Lack of medical professionals um, that serve on your collaborative, okay, and child welfare treatment provider or other court policies um, that prevent um, or regard are regarding um, medication-assisted treatment. So I would guess that that's preventing it. Um, so look at, look at that, look at where you are. Um, I would say that if you broke down each one of these barriers, um, certainly there are, are ways to do that and ways that you can make um, some progress in any one of these areas to, um, to start to get more comfortable with serving this population. I wanted to point out um, that we have a, um, uh, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare um, which is um, operated by Children and Family Futures, um, has put together a national work group um, that is really tasked with studying and understanding and sharing through a, a document um, information that will help not only family drug courts, but, but any of us out there working with this population specifically with opioid dependent women who are pregnant um, or who are um, postpartum. And so um, we don't go into this topic um, in depth today. It, it could probably be its own webinar um, when we talk about our family drug courts and how we see medication assisted treatment um, and how we see that with pregnant women or with women who um, you know, have newborns. But it's a very, very important issue, and I think that you're going to see more from us in terms of um, reaching out to sites. Um, and certainly you'll see uh, more when this monograph comes out. Um, but I, we wanted to point it out and let you know that it's something that will be um, getting out to the field soon, and um, it should really be a, a helpful tool for your family drug courts as it pertains to pregnant women and postpartum women. All right, I am very pleased to allow you to hear somebody else's voice. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about um, some real life scenarios with our panelists um, who include um, Judge Haskins, who I introduced earlier, and Penny Claude Felter. Um, so we're going to open this up. I'm going to pose some questions to them and, um, and let them talk about how their teams dealt with this issue. So I think um, I, I'm, I'm going to open this up to Penny first. What were some of the key barriers in accepting medication-assisted treatment clients in your family drug court? 
Thank you, Teresa. And again, welcome to all of um, our audience across uh, the United States. I know Judge Haskins and I are happy to be here and to uh, participate in this um, panel discussion. Our Family Drug Court program has been in existence in Kansas City, Missouri since 1998. And I will tell you that from the very beginning, we were open um, to medication-assisted treatment. And as I have been sitting here listening to Teresa's um, presentation, I was struck by the fact that in the beginning, we were primarily looking at methadone. Um, and then through the evolution of the past um, 16 years, we've seen new medication-assisted treatments become available to our family drug court um, participants. And so we are lucky in that we never had a specific barrier. Uh, when we had a barrier, it has been in the form of uh, working with barrier. It has, um, as an example, a methadone clinic, um, particularly in the early years, where we weren't on the same page um, all the time with particular clients, um, where we felt at times that uh, clients were going into the clinics and they were providing specific information to the clinics that required uh, an increased dosage. And some of the information that was being conveyed by the clients was not always accurate, shall we say. And so in order to reduce that barrier and overcome um, our concerns, we found it necessary to ask clinics, um, specifically clinics that were, we were experiencing these um, issues with, to come to us or we would come to them um, to talk about specific clients, to basically lay it uh, out there, um, what our expectations were, what our concerns were, what we were seeing. Um, oftentimes the, the clinic was not seeing the same thing that we were seeing in terms of the client not being able to focus, um, not being able to process information. Um, there were perhaps concerns about safety for children. And so I guess the communication piece at times has been a barrier, but we are not shy about um, calling a meeting and inviting folks to come to that meeting and talk about the issues at hand. So I would say that communication um, is key in overcoming and reducing barriers. Judge Haskins? Our family drug court in Tulsa also started in 1998. Um, I did uh, ultimately determine that there is no child welfare policy in Oklahoma through the Oklahoma Department of Human Services addressing the use or prohibition against MATs. However, I was the uh, fourth judge to pick up uh, the responsibilities of Tulsa Family Drug Court, and I'm now in my fifth year. Uh, when I picked up those responsibilities, I adopted all of my predecessors' policies and procedures, which were in writing. And in fact, those writings were very clear as to why MATs were not to be permitted. Uh, the policy against MATs were based on the fact that parents were trading one addiction for another, and that Family Drug Court's goal was to achieve total abstinence. Uh, the second policy consideration was that MAT treatment was not sustainable by the cli clients, and ultimately they would be uh, withdrawing from that treatment. The third policy or stated reason was that there were no or, no or poor relationships with MATs. Also, the fourth was that MAT providers exercised poor control of their medications. And then fifth, finally, that MATs, MAT use furthered illegal activities and addiction. Our policies uh, denied admission into family drug court for natural parents who have had a prescription uh, for a nar narcotic or an MAT, and then ultimately if it was discovered that a parent went on an MAT mm -hmm. after they were in drug court, they were required to be MAT free before phasing up or even having unsupervised visitation. I think that those policies didn't really address or confront the increasingly complex problems that our clients have, and that changing landscape of drugs, their drug of choice, and how to deal with their drug of choice. Uh, it was a significant impediment or an embar a barrier for me to become convinced that people in MATs can safely parent their children, and that they're not a safety risk if they are appropriate with their MAT plan. I'll tell you in a minute after we get to the next slide why I changed my mind and how I managed to change the minds of others. But I will tell you, since March of 2012, when we changed our policies formally, I've had now 13 parents uh, graduate from family drug court who have been treated with MATs. 
and since March of 2012, I have not had a single child come back into DHS custody uh, of those parents that were on MATs. And in fact, we've kept close contact with those parents to see if they're continuing their, their proper treatment plans. I do have currently have another five parents who are set to graduate in August. So with our reluctance, and despite uh, the history in our court, these um, have served our clients well. They've helped our parents succeed. Uh, not only at overcoming their addiction, but help them function in life. Penny? And Judge Haskins, I um, can appreciate the work that you did in Oklahoma to, um, to pave the way. I know one of the um, benefits of what we have in Missouri is the fact that uh, Mark Stringer is, um, he's um, the director of the Department of Mental Health, and he is extraordinarily um, supportive of MAT and recognizes the benefit so um, our, fa our family drug courts, our adult drug courts, and other drug courts in the state of Missouri have the blessing of the Department of Mental Health for MAT and to be able to provide that service to their um, participants. Um, I know that um, you know, there are still some pockets um, in the state of Missouri that there are people who um, are not accepting of MAT and for the, the, the miss that Teresa had uh, pointed out uh, previously can still be a barrier. So it's my hope that as other um, treatment court programs find um, the uh, success of participants, that it's that steady acceptance of looking at what others have achieved by using medication-assisted treatment for their families, for their other um, participants in treatment court that it will begin to reduce, um, just through nat natural attrition, the barriers that still may be in existence. And I think it's um, important to have that open mind, again, that Teresa had talked about early on in the presentation, to just have that sense of consideration. Um, any new concept or paradigm shift uh, requires, I believe at least, the consideration piece. You don't have to totally accept from the beginning, but at least be able to uh, think of the possibility of what that might mean for those participants who might not otherwise be successful. And it's all about being successful in family drug court or any treatment court as far as I'm concerned, to be able to help that participant regain control of their, of their lives. And if it means that um, an appropriate a closely monitored medication-assisted treatment is available and has the, again, the possibility of helping that client move forward, I think it's important to look at it. All right. Thank you, Penny and Judge Hanson. Oh, sorry about that. Judge, did you want to say something else? About barriers? I was just going to follow up very quickly and, and say that, you know, Oklahoma is a very conservative state and any judge who participates in a, family, in a drug court treatment program, I think one of the job requirements or job descriptions is that we have to be open-minded because what we do is a, is a clear departure from, from the normal processes or routines or procedures of, of serving as a judge. Uh, I would simply just say open, be open-minded. And I would also tell you that once I changed our policies, if they had not been successful, and uh, had not, did not serve to the benefit of the children that we were trying to reunify with their parents and help parents overcome addiction, I would have changed our policies again. But uh, I will tell you it's been immensely successful for our clients. And, uh, you know, it was a hard uh, thing to do. It was a hard thing to convince uh, my presiding judge and others that it was the right thing to do. But at the time has demonstrated it, it was proper. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I, I want to move on to, uh, and you've alluded to this a little bit, but um, for both of you, um, what, what were some of the approaches that you took? Um, because I'm assuming you had to do some education with the child welfare folks, um, even the alcohol and drug folks in the courts re re regarding um, medication-assisted treatment. So how did you approach that issue? Well, in Kansas City, we routinely, uh, with our family drug court program, we, um, we routinely have what we call core team meetings where we talk about different issues, and we've done that um, from the very beginning. 
and we continue to do that. And so it's a matter of getting everyone in the same room at the same time, hearing the same information. Um, the other, the other uh, suggestion that I would make if other jurisdictions are considering doing just that is breaking down the information um, in such a fashion that it is understandable for laypersons. Um, I think sometimes it can be intimidating uh, to even begin to pronounce some of the words uh, with medication-assisted treatment. And so making sure that everyone understands what it does, how it's going to uh, help that individual. Looking at, again, going back to success, what other courts have been using and the success that they have had in using medication-assisted treatment. Um, I think becoming knowledgeable um, about, I mean, there are federal laws, and Judge Haskins, you can speak to that, um, to make sure that uh, folks who are using medication-assisted treatment are not discriminated against. And so there is federal protection um, specifically that speaks to that very issue. You know, one would be the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I, I guess that could be a cautionary um, suggestion for folks who are struggling with whether to or not accept medication-assisted treatment. Judge Haskins? In uh, January of 2012, I had an experience that caused me to reach out to persons that are brighter than myself to talk about MATs. Uh, in essence, what I had is I had a mother of two children who was participating in Tulsa County Fam Family Drug Court. Uh, she was totally compliant. In fact, I would even describe her as what I'll call a poster child for folks participating in her program. She was employed. She had a home. She was visiting her children. And uh, I was about to enter an order for trial unification when it was discovered by our family drug court team that she was on MATs. Uh, she was aware of our Tulsa County family drug court policies against MATs, so she hid it. Uh, when it was discovered, I responded just as our policies and procedures provided for. So I ignored her needs, I ignored her progress, and based upon our existing policy, I entered an order suspending her unsupervised visitation with her children. You know, her response was, was quite predictable. And her response was to immediately try to not medically uh, detox or titrate off, whatever term you want to use, off of her MAT. Um, the very sad result was that she disappeared. Uh, what contact we had with that mother would only be described as that she had a psychotic break. Uh, she became homeless, jobless. She obviously, she relapsed. She went back to her old criminally oriented uh, drug using friends. Uh, before we could stabilize her, she simply vanished. Uh, her rights to her children were ultimately terminated by consent, by publication. Uh, before I went to California, I, I happened to try to look this mother up again on our, uh, in our computer system just to see if we'd had any other contact with her. And what I learned was that she had had another child, but that, and that child was immediately taken into DHS custody, you know, at the hospital. After the child was taken from her, she'd never visited that child. She left the hospital immediately and has not been seen from, heard from since, and uh, her rights will soon be terminated as to that child for a, a variety of reasons, including abandonment. I, I'm lucky in that I've got a next-door neighbor who's a good friend of mine, and he's the dean and president of the University of Oklahoma School of Community Medicine. I, uh, I guess I'll call it my, my therapy, which is walking my dog, but also occasionally seeing my friend Jerry Clancy and just talking to him. and. I talked to him about MATs, and, and I talked to him generally what had somewhat happened with my mom and uh, without going into in depth. But he also explained to me that MATs not only act as an agonist against continued drug use, they also allow persons to function normally. And, um, you know, I, I never viewed it that way. And, and I don't know that I have always heard that kind of description from the use of MATs. But uh, generally, he was describing to me how you know, the, a significant impairment comes of, a, of the human brain as a result of prolonged substance abuse. And he was talking to me about how uh, as uh, technology advances that someday we're going to have PET scans where you can just something the size of a pen and you can rub it on someone's head and you can see you know, the devastation or the damage that's been inflicted upon the human brain by use of prolonged substance abuse. And that will help refine treatment programs and the use of MATs. Uh, he introduced me to the University of Oklahoma's MAT program expert. Uh, 
Basically, folks, I'll tell you, I learned that MATs, uh, the use of MATs, it's a medical issue, and it's one to be controlled by medical professionals. Uh, the policies that I subsequently adopted, uh, while I won't say that I've wrapped my arms in welcome MATs, I think I've gotten smarter about recognizing that it's a medical issue, and it's one to be dealt with by medical experts. And uh, it shouldn't be viewed any differently than allowing a bipolar client or, or a client who's on diabetes to take their medication. That's, you know, you make an excellent point, Judge Haskins, and, um, and, and toward that end, I just want to point out that you're right, it is a medical issue, and, you know, every one of you probably came to your dr family drug court team and said, wow, you know what, for me to be a part of this team, I have to operate a little differently than I'm used to. Um, I, I would say the same, we're expecting the same from medical providers to some degree, um, because we do need them at the table. And it's going to be a little different for them and for us to have, start communicating about these um, issues. And so I think that if, if you just think about how you got to the team and how you function on the team, um, be thinking about you know, what you would ask of your medical providers and the people that you're collaborating with. You know, what do you need from them? What information needs to go back and forth? Um, you know, how are you both going to be on the same page to get to the same goal? So. Um, Judge, you make an excellent point, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Teresa, so, can I talk about one last issue yes, before we move on? Yes, absolutely. Please. Uh, following our presentation in Anaheim, uh, the, the biggest question that kept coming up to me as a judge, you know, following my presentation were individuals who, who were coming up to me, and, and I had several over a period of a couple of days and talking about their policies. And, you know, judges who are normally very progressive uh, because their willingness to participate in, in uh, treatment courts and still have a lot of folks have very conservative views with regard to MATs, and a lot of the discussions that were being presented to me were, well, this is what we do. Do you think that we are violating federal law? And I, and I found that uh, kind of a fascinating conversation to have with another another judge because I, I, obviously I, I'm reluctant to ever give any kind of legal opinions, but I would say most of the policies that folks were putting forward to me are differentiated between a, a right to appeal that the person may have if, if they're excluded from ATs or subsequently removed versus violation of federal law. And so anyone who wishes to talk to me about this, I'd be most happy to do it. I don't know why I do it in this setting, but just as Teresa mentioned earlier, I'd refer you to the Legal Action Center's report of December 1st, 2011, legality of denying access to medication-assisted treatment in the criminal justice system. I'd also point you to uh, the Adult Drug Court Best Practices Standards, Section G, which is at page 44, and also the Dr Drug Court Judicial Bench Book, which is Section 4.14 in Addiction Medicine, that's at page 76. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable having a conversation about whether your policies will preclude you from being sued, but I think most judges, you know, we worry about those kinds of issues, and especially if we're in a state like Oklahoma, that, that doesn't necessarily warm up to the idea of therapeutic courts in the context of, you know, judges don't want to be viewed as, as delegating judicial responsibility to a, a group of votes. Uh, but I would encourage you to read that information and draw your own conclusions because I think that that is a real issue that's coming up and the medical providers that I know are pointing out that these are folks with disabilities, at least in the medical context, uh, whether it meet that, uh, that legal criteria that's something for you to draw your own conclusions from. Thank you, Teresa. Excellent point. Um, I'm going to move on and throw this question out to you both. Please describe the importance of cross-system cross collaboration, um, which we've been touching on a little bit. And maybe if one of you could specifically talk about um, you know, how child welfare has been involved and, um, and or maybe how you sort of help them get to the point where this is um, acceptable. So I'll throw that question out to both of you. Well, with um, with Kansas City, with our family drug court program, uh, our child welfare system has been at the table from the very beginning. And to my knowledge, um, in the past 15 years since I've been the program manager of the family drug court program, we've not had um, any, you know, any sign or um, concern from child welfare regarding MAT and whether it should or should not 
be used. We're guided by, in part by our treatment programs that have access to some of the medication-assisted treatment and to our um, other clinics that, that provide it. And so we're looking at it from uh, a medical standpoint as we, as we do with addiction issues and if that individual actually needs that medication. Um, in terms of medical professionals and our uh, process, um, we, we've never had a specific medical professional sit on our core team. Uh, certainly in the very beginning when we were planning our family drug court program, we had medical folks who came to the table and helping us decide what our program was going to look like, the components of our program. When we've had questions um, in the past and certainly um, currently, we reach out to those medical professionals that we um, that we are aware of and who um, at, will answer our questions and help us move past whatever point that we're struggling with. Judge Haskins? May I contact the operator, please? Yes. Uh, let me typically describe what we do. And again, because child welfare in Oklahoma has no policies with regard to MATs, they looked to me when I changed the policies to try to determine how to, how to face this issue. And, and first, let me tell you that you know, our drug court policies, our treatment plans, our ISPs do not mandate MAT use. But what they do provide for is that if it's chosen by the parent, it requires compliance with the MAT provider's treatment protocols and family drug court rules. And generally, our treatment plans provide that if you, if you go the MAT route, that you have to satisfy their requirements, but their requirements do not satisfy our ISP treatment plan requirements. They're mutually exclusive. Uh, our MAT providers have become really important partners in, in our drug court and in the success of our parents. Uh, basically, I, I recognize that uh, a lot of our MAT providers uh, don't do a good job. They don't closely monitor uh, the folks that work with them. So we, we shopped them out and approached them and said, you know, I'm going to create a policy that's going to allow folks, if they choose, to come to you all as a service provider. But if you don't cooperate with us, I'm going to provide that they can't go to you that they will go to someone who will cooperate with us and help provide information. So, so basically our treatment plans provide that only approved MAT providers can be used, that those approved providers will closely supervise MAT use. They're going to drug test with MAT to make sure the folks are actually taking it and they're supervised. That's a very big issue. And they're also drug testing for other drugs just like we do in drug court. Uh, the good MAT programs that, that I permit require in-house counseling. And they also share information with our family drug court team. You know, releases are signed for all family drug court team members. And, uh, you know, the parents, our, our parents have to comply with all the MAT providers' requirements, which includes drug, drug testing and counseling. And, again, the, the satisfaction of the MAT providers' requirements is independent of, of our own treatment plan requirements. It just permits it if they choose to do so. Now, I try to stay away from a lot of the understanding of, I've intentionally stayed away, except for a cursory understanding of what MAT, MATs do, because I don't ever want to be viewed as someone who's practicing medicine or encouraging it, but I also don't want to discourage it either. Um, our, our MAT providers have frequently given us information about our clients that we didn't know, and they're giving us information about things that are turning up in their UAs that we did not catch. It's saving us money with regard to our own drug testing because they're verifying that they're taking their MATs, that they're looking for other drugs. They're helping us establish to what extent you can with UAs, establish levels so that they're compliant. And probably most importantly, with our MAT providers, none of our family drug court participants are allowed to participate in any kind of carryout programs. So they, they supervise their use of MATs. They're not allowed to walk out of the door no matter where they are in their phases. So very simply, they've become really good partners. Uh, they provide us wonderful information, and it's been a great sense of use to us in the success for our, our parents. That's wonderful. Thank you to both of you. Um, I know we have, we, we, have, um, we have quite a few slides left, but we're um, sort of looking at the time and um, 
the slides that you have, and I, I failed to mention this at the beginning, um, some of the slides you have are a little bit different than what you saw up here today. We didn't add any, but we subtracted some. So, um, so I just wanted to point that out. If you're trying to follow exactly what you um, pulled down from online, it will be a little bit different. Um, so I want to go on to the next question, and then, um, then we'll start taking some questions. So what are the next steps? in regards to policy and practice. And I'm going to throw that out to our two professionals who have done this. What, what, what do you see as the next steps for these folks on the webinar today um, to start using MAT either at all or more effectively? Well, certainly I think that it's going to be um, important for their respective drug court teams um, to sit down together as a group, um, to bring community stakeholders, if necessary, um, to the group, at least at some point in time. Maybe they're going to start with their core team, but then to expand it. And I think keeping it simple, um, and, and, and simple to me mean, would mean pros and cons. Um, the, the list of what's going to benefit participants in your program and what could be the barriers or the concerns. And I think um, establishing that, um, that simple list, uh, looking at other close um, uh, jurisdictions that perhaps are using medication-assisted treatment, even maybe doing a little day trip um, if, if it's doable, to see how it works in their system or having the conversations with other pertinent team members, either judge to judge or administrator to administrator. But beginning to look at what might be beneficial and if it's doable for your community. I know one of the issues um, that we learned in Anaheim, some of the rural um, jurisdictions, they don't have anybody that they can send their clients to. So that would be a barrier. You know, what, what can you do to make it a policy and then have it actually be a practice? Um, and that could be huge um, if it's a rural jurisdiction. Uh, I think community support, what it looks like in your community. Is everyone going to be aghast at medication-assisted treatment occurring for, for drug court participants? But I think beginning um, with the, the simple process of the pros and cons, I think can open up other doors and other avenues to determine whether or not it's going to be beneficial for your program. Judge Haskins? You know, I'm very proud of everybody that participates in treatment-related courts because it is, you know, where justice and, and treatment come together. I would just encourage all of you to um, gather information as you can, talk about it in your respective drug court teams, talk about what you believe would work or why you should give some consideration to it, and, and maybe what you can do is stick your toe in the water just like I did and wait and see how it turns out and, and if it's something that is productive and useful. And after all, what we're trying to do is help overcome difficulties in parents' lives, help get children home, because as a general rule, we all believe that those children are better off being at home rather than anyplace else if we can overcome safety issues, if we can help overcome those barriers and make it a safe place for these children. So I would encourage you to contact me. You know, please contact uh, Penny or Teresa. If you'd like to contact me by email or phone, I'm here, and, and I'll be more than happy to share with you uh, in more detail of what my experiences are and, and uh, you know, coming from a very, very conservative state, uh, what my concerns were and what I was willing to do. And, and I'm not going to suggest that it's always going to be appropriate for every drug court, but I would simply tell you that it's worked well for us and it's a policy that I'm going to stand by and it has served me well. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I know we have some questions that have come in. I do want to um, just direct, because we uh, are getting close to our time, I want to direct you to um, the remaining slides that we have are really uh, resources that, um, that we've referred to and talked about during this webinar. We also have um, some links to um, additional webinars coming up, and we would like for you to take a look at those and register if there's something that you think can help. Also, if we don't get to your question here in the next few minutes, um, you can go to our blog and post the question, and we will send that information out um, 
via the blog, but also um, if you want us to reply specifically to you, you can email us and that contact information is on the last slide. So I'm sorry to breeze through that, but we wanted to certainly um, address some of the questions. One of the questions that uh, came in is, you know, um, the concern around um, clients or participants um, being lethargic um, and being lethargic not only in, in treatment, but being lethargic uh, as they are parenting their children. And so um, what I would say about that is if, if, if you're seeing a, a participant who's a MAP participant who is lethargic, um, the, probably the first thing that you need to do is um, talk about that concern with the team and certainly talk about uh, that concern with the, with the MAP provider because um, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be lethargic. So if they're being dosed correctly and you're seeing that, then, then that's an issue that, again, you need to take back to the MAP provider and, and talk about the implications for that type of behavior and, and the implications it has on the forward progress of this family and get them on board um, in terms of re-looking at that dosage and looking at what else might be going on with this participant that um, might, might need to be considered. So it might be a drug testing issue. Um, so it, it can also be a dosing issue. The second question that came in is a little similar in a way because it um, is asking how do, um, how do you manage the abuse of um, Suboxone and, and that seems to be an issue in some communities and um, again, this medication is being prescribed and dispensed um, by physicians. And so much like pres other prescription medications we've talked about today, whether it's Vicodin or um, you know, Percocet, um, it can be abused. It can be sold. It can be, um, you know, if, if, if it's not dealt with correctly. So some of the ways that you can deal with that issue, if you think that's happening with a participant, go back to the provider and talk about, you know, how can we minimize this? Is there a way to ensure that, that this participant is not cheeking their, um, you know, if it's an oral medication, that they are, um, that they're taking it appropriately and not misusing it? So those are some of the things that um, I would say, again, it all goes back to communicating and bringing that medical provider in. Let them help you solve that issue. Um, and so, but that's going to take open communication. So if you have other questions, you can type them into the chat box. Um, we, we can take maybe one or two more. I think in the meantime, um, we're going to advance the slides to talk about um, some of the upcoming resources. This is the Legal Action Center paper link that um, both Judge Haskins and I referred to that I think is really helpful for courts, uh, the, the family drug court team to read. Um, also the adult drug court best practices standards and the drug court judicial bench book that Judge Haskins referred to are on your slides. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any other questions coming in, so um, please visit our blog at www.familydrugcourts.blogspot.com. Um, the National Re Center on um, Substance Abuse and Child Welfare um, has some webinars that um, we listed here on this slide, and um, you could take part in if you are interested, and they specifically deal with MAT during pregnancy, postpartum. And then, last but not least, we have um, our upcoming next webinar, which is Key Considerations for Assessing Families in Recovery for reunification. So that's going to be Thursday, July 10th, and we would love to have you be on that webinar. Um, 
We hope that if you have any questions for any of the presenters or for around this topic at all, let us know. Here's uh, our contact information. Um, you can contact Dr. Young um, in place of me, and, and I'm sure she can answer your questions, but we will certainly make sure that we get back to you. Um, Judge Haskins' information is here, as is Penny's. So we want to thank you for attending this webinar today. We hope that it's been helpful, and we hope that it raises some questions um, and gets your team excited to talk about this issue and to start um, really thinking about where you can move forward on this issue of medication-assisted treatment in your families. Thank you. Thank you.